Hello, my name is Dr. Alan Lumsden. I'm the medical director for the Horton Vascular Center here, and welcome to the Debakey CV Live Studios. I want to introduce the two uh, guests and friends who are present in the studio with me. Uh, on my far left is uh, Dr. Robert Jackson. He really was the brain power behind creating this lectureship. And I know he wants me to acknowledge uh, the late Dr. William Winters, uh, our friend, colleague, who had a tremendous impact on Methodist <coughs> and really also helped put together this lectureship. Dr. Maddox, welcome. Before you. we have you speak, let me give you your formal introduction as, as best I can. And if I gave the entire summary, you wouldn't have any time left <laughs> to give the Debakey lectureship. So, but it certainly warrants an introduction. And Dr. Ken L. Maddox is easily one of the most recognized surgeons around the globe. Uh, when I was at Emory, actually when I was in Edinburgh, uh, we knew the name uh, Ken Maddox and it was synonymous with Houston and it was synonymous with trauma. And we're glad to say at uh, one time he was a colleague in the same department. He, for many years, has been the Distinguished Service Professor at the Michael A. D. Bakey Department of Surgery at Baylor College of Medicine. And perhaps what he's best known for him is being the Chief of Staff and the Chief of Surgery at Ben Taub Hospital. Uh, I think everybody would agree Ben Taub would be nowhere where it is without the name Ken Maddox being associated with it. He helped develop the international known Bed Top General uh, Emergency Center and its equally respected uh, Level 1 Trauma Center. And clearly his reputation as an innovator in trauma care is known worldwide as I've alluded to. And he's made significant contributions in trauma resuscitation, trauma systems, thoracic trauma, vascular injury, auto-transfusion, amongst many others. His textbook, Trauma, is an international bestseller now in, I believe, it's your ninth edition, and he's co-editor of Sabison's Textbook of Surgery, one of the best-known textbooks, and he's a co-editor of Rich's Vascular Trauma. That's what he's contributed nationally and internationally. Locally, he has created and written a fifth book and, term, and termed the history of surgery in Houston and recounts the last 50 years of Houston's impressive, and I think we're going to hear somewhat colorful, surgical history. He's authored over 600 articles, 1,000 abstracts, and has been editorial reviewer for over 15 different journals. Amongst his amazing uh, accolades, he's past president of the American Association for the Surgery of Trauma and past treasurer of the Michael DeBakey International Surgical Society. His local contributions also contribute to some of the disaster planning, particularly around Katrina, and he was part basically of creating this evacuation city for 27,700 refugees built in about 18 hours. So I could certainly go on and on. Um, when Dr. Maddox came over, we said, what do you want us to do with your slides? And he said, I'm not, I have no slides. <laughs> I'm going to tell you some stories. So with that in mind, he's also graciously agreed to take any questions that you may have. We'll run the, the banners that showing you how you can text in questions or go on the web. But with that, <coughs> Dr. Maddox, thank you for agreeing to do this. I can't think of anybody better to give this lecture. Uh, thank you, Dr. Lumsden. We're all in this together. We are uh, here uh, to honor uh, the DeBakey Heart and Vascular Institute. We're here to honor Dr. DeBakey. Uh, Dr. Jackson and I chatted for a little while on what should be my topic and what should be the focus and uh, looking at the previous lectures, uh, they've all been given by people who uh, knew Dr. DeBakey and talked about his academic, uh, his technical, his scientific advances. I thought I would talk to you about uh, personal memories of a legacy. And uh, it would start uh, in about 1958, 1960, when I first got to know who Dr. DeBakey was. And I want to share with you 10 uh, vignettes that uh, many of which have never been told before. And uh, there was not the opportunity to make slides to document some of these incidences. And I thought you would find not only the incidences, but what impact they had on medicine and on me, and the precedent they set um, to uh, be interesting. And that's why I chose them. I uh, first came to Houston in 1958 to give a paper when I was in college, two papers. And uh, we learned of Dr. DeBakey then. I learned of him later in 1959 when I interviewed for medical school and then when I arrived in 1960. Remember Dr. DeBakey arrived as chairman at age 38 in Houston in 1950 
And so I uh, first met him eight years uh, after uh, he came as chairman. And um, I went to a lecture hall and they were beginning to tout the great things about Baylor College of Medicine. And this uh, young chairman parked his car outside the door, left the motor running and came in and showed us a movie. It was one of the many movies he made about uh, cardiac surgery and vascular surgery, mainly vascular surgery. And uh, it was a very interesting, stimulating movie, which uh, led me into saying, I want to do that kind of thing. But at the same time, I was able to ask him, uh, what caused you to do this? If you remember, um, in 1950s, the treatment of vascular and cardiac conditions was all medical maybe sympathectomies, uh, uh, but uh, Dr. DeBakey said without hesitation, I really am looking for uh, a surgical solution to cardiac and vascular disease. And he built his career on that one uh, uh, vision. Now I told you his car was left running. When he got through talking to us, he went out, got in the car and it left. So I asked the moderator, what's all this? He said, well, he doesn't want to waste any time. <laughs> and uh, indeed, uh, uh, he kept the car running to get back to Methodist to the next case. So I said to myself, why is he doing that? And so it's uh, time management, obsessed with uh, a busy schedule and getting a lot of things done. Later, as a student, I uh, had clinical rotations and uh, I saw the way th that he operated. The operation was a very tight business with uh, uh, afternoon rounds with the consultants, a chart in the office of every patient. Every operation preoperatively would have the x-rays reviewed and he himself, using a number two black pencil and a red pencil, make drawings of uh, the, uh, the pathology. And if they were post-op, he made a drawing of the operation. Um, and I said to myself, I'm going to do that. And to this day, to this day, uh, operations that I do that are vascular or cardiac, I make a drawing of what I have done. And uh, anyone who reviews the chart after that uh, will know exactly what we did, why we did it, and it can be seen in uh, nanoseconds. Number three incident was uh, as I was finishing medical school, Dr. DeBakey got wind that I was looking for a surgical internship in residency. And he called all of us who were interested in surgery into his office. Now I had never been in his inner sanctum before, uh, uh, and uh, so I was honored. And I thought, well, how long is this gonna take? And, it took about five minutes and he told me how foolish I was in looking at the various Eastern schools I was looking at and uh, but uh, I should stay at Baylor but that he would support me wherever I wanted to go and write a letter for me which he did and I did go and interview in those locations but I stayed on uh, at Baylor. I, I was impressed that uh, uh, in five minutes, he was able to uh, tell me I had a place here if I wanted. He was saying, I will support you wherever you go and uh, keep focused. He gave me some advice on, on how I would be successful as an intern. After my internship, I uh, went to uh, the Army. I was in part of the Berry Plan. Dr. DeBakey uh, had told me uh, he would make me an essential resident because he knew um, Lyndon Johnson. And so when I got my draft notice, he said, ignore it. And so I ignored it. And about a month later, I got another letter saying, you obviously ignored the first letter. Uh, you have 24 hours to accept our commission or we're gonna draft you as a private. So before I talked to Dr. DeBakey, I uh, accepted my commission. But that taught me even powerful people, DeBakey, Lyndon Johnson, don't always get their way. <clears throat> the fourth uh, item is uh, after I came back from the Army, I rotated several times on Dr. DeBakey's service, both in the operating room and on services. First in the operating room, 
Uh, I remember as a first year resident, one, uh, one day we had 13 operations on the schedule. He was running three rooms. We go from room to room to room as associates were there assisting uh, in uh, the operation. Uh, along about seven o'clock or so, eight o'clock, he had ordered hamburgers and told us out at the nursing station is uh, hamburgers. So everyone got to eat hamburgers. Finally, at about 11.30 at night, we uh, were finished. And he looked at the schedule, it was all over. And speaking to no one in particular, he stuck his head outside the operating room door and yelled as loud as he could yell, hey, anybody else out there want an operation? We're just getting warmed up and are ready to go. <laughs> Whew, we were all dragging. We'd been going since 6 a.m. Uh, Dr. DeBakey, I learned then, loved a long day. He had a sense of humor. He had, and he, and he, and he cared. And uh, I had not seen that sense of humor before. The fifth area I'd like to share with you is uh, uh, the rumor that is often uh, cited in jest, often cited as being something very bad for residencies, is the notorious three-month rotation. During the residency, Dr. DeBakey had uh, rotations uh, in the hospital, in the ICU, and on the floor that lasted three months at a time. Um, I had that rotation three times. So nine months, uh, I never left, I didn't have it back to back, it was three separate times. Um, and in the ICU, you checked in and did not leave. If you, went, if you wanted to see your family, they would bring clean clothes, sometimes food, up to the ICU. Um, and so the three-month rumor is really real. My first rotation was actually during my first year. I came in on a Sunday afternoon. The rotation started on a Monday. Um, I was handed the new patient list, 300 patients, and I was supposed to do a history and physical on all of them. I learned very quickly how to do a complete history and physical by walking in the door and say, only answer the questions I ask you, uh, bear your groins and let me see your neck and let me hear, listen to your chest. Do you have any allergies? What are your previous operations? And could fill out those papers uh, very uh, uh, quickly because I knew before that evening was over, I'd have to present those patients plus the old patients uh, to uh, Dr. Uh, DeBakey. And um, uh, I, um, uh, it, was a, it was probably the most valuable rotations of my entire residency. It caused me to be very skeptical of the ACGME when they had the mandatory 80-hour work week and mandatory nap time and uh, I was wondering, uh, what is this modern generation uh, coming to? I also watched him as he used every efficiency he could use, but he also wanted to know certain lab work every day. So, actually to protect myself, I took a sheet of paper, created a grid of lab data and dates where he could look at a moment's notice using number two pencil and number and, and a red pen, abnormal and normal values. And uh, he had never seen, we did not have an automatic printout of an electronic medical record. Mm. You got little slips of paper, and so I would put them on this form. And the first time he saw that, he looked at it and I got ready for maybe a scolding and he said, uh, we're going to do this from now on. Mm. So every resident that followed me had reason to hate me because <laughs> it took extra work to do that on every single patient. But uh, there's always a better way. There's always, always a better way. And it's our opportunity to find it. And I learned it uh, at that moment. Number six. <clears throat> um, as I was finishing my um, residency in general surgery and then thoracic surgery, 
I, um, uh, Dr. DeBakey knew I was looking for some jobs. I was looking for academic jobs. I was looking for jobs in the government, perhaps. I was looking at jobs uh, uh, in the private sector. And uh, uh, out of the clear blue sky one day, the scrub nurse said to me, Dr. DeBakey wants to talk to you about any future employment. He thinks you might do good here. Uh, uh, are you ready to talk to him? I said, oh, great, I'm gonna get some advice. So I said, Dr. DeBakey, uh, I understand you know that I'm looking and you have some advice for me. And so he said to me uh, without any hesitation, uh, yeah, uh, I want you to go over to Ben Taub and help George. Well, George was the, uh, was the surgeon in chief at Ben Taub and George Rule had just decided to go work with Dr. Cooley. And so we had one surgeon who had just finished with hepatitis at the Ben Taub. And he said, uh, Dr. Jordan will give you your job description uh, and if you need any help, I'll always watch your back. Well, I said, Dr. DeBakey, I haven't even done all my inter... He stopped me in mid-sentence. And that one took about two minutes. Um, and um, so this is where you're going to work. Actually, my entire career has been at Ben Taub. I've looked at other jobs, but I've been very happy. And as I uh, ultimately assumed George Jordan's job, Dr. DeBakey was chancellor at Baylor, uh, been president at Baylor. And at times, people didn't like decisions I made. They sometimes would call Dr. DeBakey and say, Maddox has done such and such. And yes, he always did have my back. He said, what did he do? And even though we hadn't talked about it, he said to them, he's doing exactly what I told him to do. He's taking care of the patients and this is the right thing to do. Get off his back. So uh, then 30 seconds later, I would get a phone call. And he'd say, what have you done? <laughs> and I'd tell him, and he's, well, he did the right thing, keep doing the right thing, and keep the patient front first, and everything uh, will be uh, okay. And yes, we supported George. There was just the two of us responsible for every case. And George was tired from his hepatitis. And uh, so I got the opportunity to scrub on lots and lots of cases. Mm -hmm sometimes 13 cases a day. And I felt like uh, my previous time prepared me for that. My seventh incident, I don't think I have ever told anybody anywhere. It occurred after a meeting of the Society of Vascular Surgeon where almost everybody in our department had a paper. Uh, Dr. Howell, Dr. Morris, uh, Dr. Crawford, I think Charlie McCollum had a paper. All of them have give talk, given talks probably in this very room uh, to this very group. So at the first faculty meeting, they, we had a, almost assigned seats where everybody sat. And as, um, as uh, we were just beginning, everybody started babbling, starting with Jimmy Howell, who, uh, started saying, uh, uh, we have to change the Society of Vascular Surgery. It's going to hell. No longer are they giving papers on techniques in surgery. Um, and uh, George Moore said, what are you talking about? And he said, you know that paper that so-and-so gave on uh, the influence of arachidonic acid on uh, femoral and popliteal artery uh, metabolism uh, I didn't understand a word they said. So George Morris and Stan Crawford joined in with them and said, yeah, uh, you know, what difference does that make? And Dr. DeBakey let that go on for about five minutes as it degenerated as only surgical meetings can degenerate with strong personalities that have strong opinions about things that maybe they didn't know much about. Finally, uh, Dr. DeBakey tapped his pen on the table and said, gentlemen, I think you're wrong. 
you don't even know what arachidonic acid is. <laughs> and then he talked about this fatty acid and its metabolites. And then he started at the top and he went through the entire intermediary metabolism of arachidonic acid. I didn't know anything, so I took a piece of paper and I started taking notes. I took voluminous notes, and when he, because I thought he was going to be wrong. <laughs> what would a surgeon know about arachidonic acid? So I looked it up, and sure enough, everything he said was absolutely correct. Big lesson. So I said to myself, when did Dr. DeBakey have time? to learn this. He had heard in a lecture and he had picked up a journal, he picked up a book and he had methodically memorized because he thought this was going to be important and other metabolites were going to be important, especially as we do combination therapies, whatever those combination therapies are for cardiovascular disease, be they mechanical, be they uh, chemical, be they genetic. Uh, it was an early time to understand the personal, uh, personalized effect of our uh, multidisciplinary uh, uh, therapies. It also caused me to say a surgeon has to be uh, understand uh, those metabolic and uh, uh, medical conditions just like the internists do. And it was the right thing to do for the Society of Vascular Surgery to uh, have these subjects. Item number eight. Uh, meanwhile, between seven and eight, uh, there were various things that happened in the Texas Medical Center. The buildings grew, the practices grew, um, and uh, personalities grew apart for a variety of reasons, and you've heard those stories over and over, particularly Dr. DeBakey and Dr. Cooley. I was at multiple meetings where sometimes they would be in the same large reception room uh, and they would be a long ways apart. As a matter of fact, remember when you were a child and played with magnets and you put the North Pole against the North Pole they almost sensed each other and would grow apart. So Dr. DeBakey and Dr. Cooley would always be a requisite distance apart from each other. Multiple attempts, some of them from uh, various organizations, including the American College of Surgeons, uh, spent time trying to get them together with awards, with whatever, whatever. Um, a number of us began to talk and um, this particular year was the year of the Olympics. The Olymp I think they were in California somewhere, maybe Los Angeles. And I watched some of those Olympics and uh, the thought occurred to me during the marathon that uh, there was always a rabbit, there was always a pacer that caused the lead runner to go faster and set new records. Ah! Got it. So George Noon, Charlie, others began to talk and said, we got to get these guys together and we're going to do it. So I first went to see Dr. Cooley and said, uh, Dr. Cooley, this is the year of the Olympics. Do you watch? Yeah. Said, You've really made great progress because you had a pacer. And if it had not been for Dr. DeBakey trying to learn pediatric cardiac surgery and heart surgery and doing the research and the operations that he did, you wouldn't have stayed ahead of him so far. It's time you thanked him for being your pacer. When do we do it? Was his answer. I said, give me a little time. So I went then to see Dr. DeBakey and said, Dr. DeBakey, you know, None of us could have been the pacer for you, as was Dr. Cooley. He wrote textbooks, he wrote articles, and you had to best him. And because he existed, you've written more papers, more journals, more operations, and created more trainees. 
it's time you recognized him. Yeah, let's do it. When do we do it and how do we do it? I said, well, we've already thought about that. <laughs> the Denton Cooley Society is meeting and he's going to recognize you. It's time for you to recognize him at the DeBakey Society meeting, which meets a month later. Both are in Houston. Well, the conversation quickly went to what presents are we going to give each other? And uh, which, whose museum are they going to go into? And the rest uh, is, is history. Both men, both giants, both record setters recognize the benefit of somebody who's in competition to you to drive you to better ways. And they, they got together, said thank you, and uh, uh, you've all seen that famous uh, uh, photograph made with my camera of Dr. Cooley and Dr. DeBakey reaching out their hands touching like uh, Michelangelo's painting in the Sistine Chapel. Um, I watched them for the next three days. They were like two golfers at the uh, uh, 19th uh, hole of a golf course, sitting in a restaurant, eating, and enjoying each other, and oblivious to everybody else in the room as they had many years to catch up. So that's number eight. <clears throat> number nine is, uh, and number 10 are really uh, quite sacred to me. Let me prepare the story. Uh, David Peirce is the director of the Houston Fire Department Ambulance Service. We recognize there are a lot of giants in Texas Medical Center, and we had a number of clues with each other. He was a Baylor faculty, an EUT faculty, and uh, he knows about Bentob, Methodist, other hospitals and medical center, and we had codes with each other on if certain VIPs were hurt. If Dr. DeBakey, who drove uh, times in his life like a bat out of hell um, to, make, to keep, keep on time, especially when Methodist Hospital had an annex, uh, I don't know if it still exists, and he'd drive with this car, uh, Lamborghini, at uh, very top speeds. So I knew he was going to have a car wreck and I knew he was going to end up at Bentob, and uh, that would have been a challenge. Uh, but David Peirce was going to say certain things to me uh, if that happened, and that would be my alerting that I was having a VIP coming, get ready for that event. One night, very late, oh, that's number one. No, uh, the, the part of that story, Arthur Bell and I uh, worked with uh, uh, the FDA on uh, 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 emergency research projects of various sorts. We wanted uh, to have a waiver of, uh, waiver of consent for emergency conditions in the pre-hospital phase. And actually, uh, Arthur and I wrote what now is in the FDA's waiver of consent uh, uh, policy. And that, uh, if you informed the public and went through an IRB and went through certain steps and you had a life-saving uh, known technique or you were evaluating a known life-saving technique, you could, uh, you could put them into a prospective, randomized, blinded even, uh, study. And we did the first of those blinded or uh, uh, some, not, sometimes not blinded, prospective, randomized uh, 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 studies. They went through the Baylor IRB. Dr. DeBakey, during that time, was deeply involved in a lot of the work uh, because he, too, was having some projects uh, that might need that. One night, about 10 o'clock, I think it was about 10 o'clock, I uh, got a phone call. David Peirce. He said, uh, I don't have much time. I want to make this fast. Uh, I just want to let you know CPR on Cherokee. 
Oh, say that again. He said, CPR on Cherokee. He says, is that what I think it is? He said, yes. This was after Dr. DeBakey's operation, after his recovery, uh, after he had uh, received the uh, gold medal from Congress. Uh, this told me that Dr. DeBakey lived on Cherokee. This told me Dr. DeBakey, at his home in Cherokee, had CPR in progress. And I said, that means you go to Methodist. And he said, yes, uh, but there's a problem. And he said, I said, what? And he said, you remember the prospective randomized study we did through the Baylor IRB to study a external compression device that you wrap the body and then turn on a button and it's like the old thumper. And uh, there were some potential problems that broke the ribs in some people. He said, um, we pulled a card, blinded, mm. randomized, and Dr. DeBakey pulled a card to apply the device. And he said, I'm calling you for permission. I said, I'm not the next of kin, but isn't this a waiver of permission, consent study? And he said, yes, but I'm calling you now. What should I do? It's Dr. DeBakey. I said, you're there? He says, yes, I'm here. <laughs> he said, look on his left wrist. He said, there is no wristband. If someone in town, and we widely circulated this, who knew about the study, did not want to be in the study, the way to tell us no was to wear this special colored wristband. And he said, there's no wristband. And I said, ironically, Dr. DeBakey and I, in the last few days, have actually talked about this study he knew about it, he knew it went through the Baylor IRB, and he does not have a wristband? He says, no, I said, put the device on him. And he put the device on him. And he came to Methodist and was not resuscitated and pronounced dead. What does this mean? Well, first, who is Dr. DeBakey and what has he done? Dr. DeBakey's CV is very thick. He has had many articles, many innovations. He's looked for the right way to do research. So the very last thing that Dr. DeBakey did was participate in a waiver of consent, prospective randomized study that actually was one of the determinants in the publication and the conclusions that caused this device. He did not have any complications from it, but uh, showed that this device was not ready for prime time in the pre-hospital phase. So he did, in the very last thing on this world, the things that he would have been most proud of. So. Uh, 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 he would have gloried in the fact that even in death, he was able to participate in a prospective, randomized, prospective waiver of consent study. He would have been so proud. That's number nine. Soon after that was his funeral. And after uh, uh, standing in state at the city hall, at uh, uh, various uh, memorials. He had the funeral at the uh, 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 Catholic Cathedral downtown. The Cardinal, uh, who runs that uh, 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 cathedral, uh, uh, was part of the service. Many people from Baylor were part of the service. And at the very end of the service, the Cardinal gave the final prayer. I, I think I was sitting on the fourth row. All very stately, all very honorable. And almost before the final amen was out, I heard the loudest boom, 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 one could imagine. 
At the back of the auditorium was a, uh, uh, a jazz band from New Orleans who was uh, uh, performing a, a, a the ritual that occurs out of respect. And playing the, this Druze music came to the front, circled the coffin, accompanied the coffin to the outside as they played when the saints go marching in. And the service was over. Those are my 10 memories of a legend. Thank you for letting me share these with you. Hard to act to follow, is what I'd say. <clears throat> Thank you. I'd say 10 stories by a master storyteller that nobody could have told better. Would you mind taking one question? And that's the question that came in is, what's your most memorable moment interacting with Dr. Bakey in the operating room? <clears throat> I was actually a student. Maybe I was an intern. I was scrubbed in the operating room, and I think I was three, three bodies back holding a retractor that someone had put in my hand. And there weren't many people in the operating room, and then I, I had to hold another retractor. And uh, all of a sudden, Dr. DeBakey stopped the operation and looked at my right hand and said, I don't know who taught you how to hold a retractor but you're never going to be a surgeon unless you hold it properly. You see, uh, uh, you've got to hold it uh, uh, this way. Um, and um, I don't remember which way it was, and he replaced my hand, which was in an awkward position. It hurt. And uh, I suddenly looked at the other hand, and it was in the way he had placed it. and. Uh, it placed it, he had put the retractor in my hand, and now it was in a wrong position, and I knew that he was gonna tell me in just a minute that that hand was wrong. No. Didn't I ever learn anything? So here I was in an almost <laughs> impossible situation, and so that was uh, a memorable moment. Robert? Mm -hmm. Dr. Maddox, thank you so much for an extraordinary lecture. Would you tell the story about your last visit with Dr. DeBakey? Uh, I believe he came over to uh, Ben Taub uh, maybe just a few weeks before he passed away. Um, the, he, actually, um, uh, he came over to Ben Taub uh, 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 the last time I remember that he was there. Um, I may have told you another story. If I tell you the wrong story, remind me. That's okay. But uh, one of the residents asked him to come over and uh, uh, would he scrub on a case? And he came over and helped scrub. Uh, so he, he, uh, I don't think he scrubbed on cases after his operation. Uh, and uh, uh, was, was all the teacher, didn't do any of the operation and uh, gave everybody advice. We, all, we took lots of pictures. Uh, but did I tell you a different incident? It was, it, I think your operating rooms were new and he came over. Uh, there was a lot of technology and you wanted to show him around and he was very interested in the new technology in the, in the operating rooms. Yes, yes, yes. Um, and uh, he was very interested in the technology. Uh, um, and we were moving towards hybrid, but he also uh, uh, picked up some instruments off the table. And he said, you know where this came from? He said, this came from the machine shop at Baylor. And so I said, how'd you know? And he showed me written on there. And it also said Jefferson Davis Hospital. Um, well, you got multiple questions now. You've piqued everyone's curiosity. If Dr. DeBakey were alive today, what would he tell residents? He would tell them uh, uh, sleep is a bad habit, that uh, uh, to stay away from patients and uh, have to have time off is mediocrity. Uh, uh, he would say uh, uh, pursue excellence in all things. 
He would say attention to detail mm -hmm. is important. He would also say enjoy poetry, enjoy reading, master whatever you read and don't ever forget it. And uh, uh, thank those people who are helping you. Very good. Is it true he fired residents from his service? <laughs> I wasn't going to tell you this story. Uh, yes, uh, I had the opportunity to uh, go back a second and third time for these three month rotations because he fired someone. And uh, I didn't believe him, but George Jordan said, Dr. DeBakey has asked for you. I said, You're lying. You just can't find anybody else to go back. So there were several floors to the old Methodist. The seventh floor was, was VIP patients, and I wasn't supposed to go there. Uh, one day, a nurse called me and uh, said, uh, Mr. So-and-so, I didn't know who Mr. So-and-so was, some sort of Greek mag ship owner, I think. Um, he had arrested post-op, mm. and he said, well, you come up here and pump on him. So I went up and we were resuscitating and uh, uh, I called down to the operating rooms. I would usually call one of the associates, uh, Dr. Lowry, uh, Dr. Noon, McCollum, others, but they were all tied up and the only person free was Dr. DeBakey. And I said, Dr. DeBakey, Mr. So-and-so is in trouble. Can you come up to the seventh floor, which he did. And uh, he walked in the room, saw who the patient was, and he fired me. <laughs> and I started arguing with him, and uh, he said, I, I, I said, you're fired. <clears throat> I said, thank you, sir. <clears throat> so I went up to my room, which I hadn't used in a long time, and I was putting my things together when the phone rang, and. I remember her voice to this moment, full of fear, and said, uh, Doctor, Doctor, uh, Doctor DeBakey wants you on the seventh floor. And I said, you tell Doctor DeBakey that I don't work here anymore. He just fired me. I don't, I don't have a job. She came back and she said, Doctor DeBakey's tired. Nobody else here to pump on chest. Uh, he just rehired you. <laughs> So I, I guess that's a yes. <laughs> okay, if there's one thing you learned from Dr. DeBakey, would you mind sharing it with us? Or you've shared a lot, actually. Anything that sticks in your mind? Um, he always took the high, hard road, the road not taken. And so the lesson I learned with Dr. DeBakey that I don't think I ever heard from him say but it's become a motto in my life, and that is uh, uh, when afraid, when in danger, go to the heart of danger and there you find safety. Don't run from responsibility. Don't run from an opportunity. But go to that problem, define that problem, and you'll find an answer. And if not, develop a study and create an answer. And so where there are differences, look for a way to find a better way. There's always a better way. And the dedicated person finds that way to be better. Very good. How would you know if Dr. DeBakey was satisfied with the procedure and the staff? He didn't fire you. <laughs> <laughs> uh, if you were still working, you knew that he was satisfied. Uh, if he didn't like what you were doing or your attitude, he would let you know. Uh, and you always knew where he was. So uh, uh, him not complaining was that you were, you, were, you were doing an A job. You were doing good. You must have traveled with him many times. I'm going to quote Charlie McCollum, tells the story that he never packed luggage. And you had to travel light, even if you were going to be in a country for a week. You were expected to carry on and carry off. Uh, yes. He did have a small bag he carried. Um, 
He also, <laughs> I've never told this, uh, he also had a garment that I've tried to get a tailor to make for me. Uh, he had black slacks that he would wear on a trip often, and uh, he would wear, like you, a bow tie. Uh, on an airplane, he would wear a blazer. But that blazer was reversible. Mm -hmm. And when you reversed it, it was a tux. <laughs> so <laughs> he wore, he would hang this bla blue blazer up, but underneath it uh, was a tux. So he had black pants, mm. and so he could wear a blazer with two or three different color ties, and he could have a week's worth of variation, and people <laughs> thought he brought a whole trunk. <laughs> well, so maybe this is the final question. Is there any procedure or process that Dr. DeBakey would want to perfect as of today? Uh, I think a disappointment to Dr. DeBakey was a total implantable, effective artificial heart. Uh, he would uh, probably want to perfect. Um, he never expressed it, but you could tell his frustration with very small vessel uh, peripheral disease. Mm -hmm. Coronaries, we have coronary, uh, uh, we have a uh, uh, saphenous vein that, that we can do a bypass and mammaries. But uh, uh, the uh, tibial bypasses, especially in, in brittle diabetics, mm -hmm. uh, we still don't have the ideal uh, approach. And uh, I think Dr. DeBakey would also be pursuing uh, 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 hybrid approaches and elimination of some of the technology that may hurt the arteries, but utilizing uh, intravascular technology where there's a hybrid approach that is actually better. Uh, an example is there are very difficult areas in trauma to get to. The subclavian artery where it joins the axillary if there is a gunshot or stab wound there, the treatment now is to pass a wire from the arm, uh, take a grabber from the groin, grab that wire, slide a, a graft over it, and you're done in very few minutes. So you're using a Dacron graft or a PTFE graft, uh, but you're also using intertechno intervascular technology to make it easier. There's always a better way. Well, Dr. Maddox, uh you gave a lecture like no others. It probably will never be repeated. <laughs> uh, as I say, you're a master storyteller. I'm sure he would be very proud of what you have achieved. Let me let Robert close it out. Thank, Thank you. Ron. Thank you very much, Dr. Maddox. I know Dr. DeBakey is looking down on us, and he's very pleased with the lecture and mm -hmm. certainly with your outstanding career. Thank you so much. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Alan.